I mean, I think this year there was always uh, going to be two cars that were going to be interesting, the McLaren because of the engine change. Um, but I think the car we was expecting to change most visually was the Alfa Romeo Sauber because of the change in nose that they'd announced quite early uh, towards the end of last season. And true enough, again, it's, um, it's an interesting looking car. First of all, uh, on the front end, obviously, we know that they've spent their two development tokens. That's the only things they're really allowed to change from the basic structure of the car from last year is, is on the nose. And they've done something quite interesting. They've not followed Mercedes like everybody else has. But what they have done is adapted their existing nose philosophy to really follow um, the, the use of the cape, which obviously is the you know, Mercedes kind of key aero treatment at the front there. And what they've really done is brought the cape right up to the nose tip. Um, they've slimmed the nose and they've changed the, you know, some of the, the ducting and the shaping there. But really it's all about how they're trying to get air onto the cape, which is the big vein that sits underneath the, the nose of virtually every F1 car now. And what they're trying to do there is trying to get the vortices that are coming off the back of the cape working with the rest of the, the, the barge boards and the side pods and all the aero along the side of the car to try and regain some of what's been lost with the floor changes this year. And it, I think they've done quite nice and quite an interesting job. One of the, the things that we notice is that Alfa Romeo very much kept the uh, inboard loaded front wing concept which everyone suggests doesn't really work with the cape and with um, barge boards and you know it, it, it loses more than it gains in other areas. Um, but I think how, the way uh, they've set this up actually looks quite um, well thought through. It's a very complicated setup. It's one of those things, it, it, if it works, it's going to work and it's going to work quite well. Um, that said, I mean, we have to remember where Alfa Romeo were in performance terms last year. I don't see that changing enormously this year. Obviously, they're going to have an improved Ferrari engine, which I'd like to talk about a little bit later as well. Um, and the chassis wasn't great last year either. But, you know, at this time of year, you're really kind of just looking at the design rather than the, what the potential performance is. So on the front, as I say, it's the inboard loaded front wing. It's got a very large cape. Um, and even where the, the, the outer parts of the wing then meet the central part, there's this big step, which we saw a little bit last year, much, but much bigger. That with the much larger flap area creates a huge amount of um, uh, airflow to create the Y250 vortex, which is one of the big key factors in pushing the front tire awake away from the rest of the car. Uh, and along with the cape that's got lots of airflow hitting it, this looks like a very powerful setup. So I think the nose is the key thing that people will notice. But then as you go back down further down the car, I mean, everyone's going to have massively complex barge boards this year. And they're going to be doing lots with uh, trying to push airflow down and also around the front part of the floor. That will create both downforce, but also create the, the flow set up along the rest of the floor to try and regain what was lost with the regulation changes. So there's quite a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, and then when we come to the mid and the back part of the car, so this is the first chance we've had to see the 2021 Ferrari engine. And if you remember last year, Ferrari's engine was a big disappointment because of lots of changes they had to make to uh, meet regulations. They lost a lot of power and they didn't really have the chassis to match it at Ferrari. But it sounds as though they've bounced back with a much better power unit this year. Now you have to take all of this sort of winter story about engine performance with a little pinch of salt because a lot of it does come from the Italian media who will either try and build Ferrari up or kind of put them down. This year it's been, you know, building them up. Everything is absolutely bomber. You know, it's going to be a fantastic engine. They're going to call it the super fast. Lots of uh, nonsensical engineering terms being thrown around about how it's going to suddenly become so much better. But uh, we can see that Ferrari have changed areas around the top end of the engine. So we can see in the Samba bodywork, or the Alfa Romeo bodywork, uh, bulges around the inlet plenum above the engine and also in the cooling package. Now we've already seen a sneak picture of the Ferrari and we know that they've got a much bigger air inlet around the roll hoop for this year, um, which suggests that they're trying to put more cooling along the centre of the car, basically above the engine in the gearbox and make the side pods smaller. Um, and I think some of this will be related to the intercooler, which we also is something that we understand that Mercedes are going to be doing. Um, one way for Ferrari to gain a little bit more performance is actually to use um, a, a composite, or sorry, a hybrid, I suppose you would call it, a, a two-type 
intercooler system. And I think this is where we're going back to. They did it in 2016, where they have both a water-to-air and an air-to-air intercooler. Both have benefits, but the air-to-air intercooler really brings the temperatures down uh, for the charger going back into the engine, and that's what really helps create power. So I think both Ferrari and Mercedes are doing something around that this year, and so far all the evidence we've seen on the bodywork tends to back that up. But we won't be until we reach Bahrain when we see the car stripped down uh, that we'll actually see what's under the skin. But certainly Sauber look as though they've made changes around that sort of top end of the body. Side pods, as everyone will be this year, um, I don't think Sauber have gone quite as far as we uh, expected. But again, we'll, we'll see what actually happens as we come to the first races. Uh, and then at the very back of the car, a couple of things that are interesting. Again, another Ferrari-related related one. This year, teams don't have to run a wastegate on the turbocharger because the MGUH effectively acts as a wastegate under most conditions. Um, so uh, Alfa Romeo have a separate wastegate exhaust above the uh, normal uh, engine outlet exhaust. So that tells us that Ferrari have kept their wastegate for this year, which doesn't seem like a, a big issue either way. Um, but the other thing that's quite telling on the Alfa Romeo is they've gone for very much a huge T-wing at the back of the engine cover ahead of the main rear wing. And this reflects the regulation changes. So changing the floor, um, cutting that little triangular section out in front of the rear tires by playing around with the diffuser strakes and with the strakes that are and the cuts that you're allowed along the edge of the floor, teams are losing downforce. So everyone's going to want to put lots of downforce back on the car, even if it's dirty downforce that comes with a big drag penalty. And the T-Wing is a classic example of where you can create some downforce in a fairly uh, brutal way in terms of drag production. And you, know, you can see that they've got a big double element one there with you know, two elements on each of those uh, aerofoil sections. So desperately trying to gain back some downforce to get performance uh, for this year. So you know, kind of front to rear, uh, I'd say the Alfa Romeo, it's a very interesting car to look at and tells us lot, lots about what Ferrari are doing and what other teams are going to be doing with their cars this year. The technical director is now uh, Jan Monchot um, and he's got a, a really long history uh, in motorsport. Um, Ferrari, Toyota, he spent a long time at Audi uh, doing their LMP programme for Le Mans, which again is a, a great basis in terms of a very technical, very organized company with lots of resources and the technology in uh, the outgoing now, sadly, LMP1H um, category. You know, lots of technology there. So that's really interesting. He's got some history at Sauber as well. Um, he's got, as we know, the facilities at Sauber, uh, well, maybe not second to none, but certainly some of the best in Formula One, especially when there's a budget behind it. So um, yeah, he, he looks like he's um, you know, the ideal man for the job. We, we are finishing the car now, um, but there will certainly be um, issues uh, to be tackled. Uh, I expect on the drivability side that maybe uh, the driver will be uh, complaining about some characteristic uh, affecting the, the, the balance of the car and their confidence in the car. In terms of pure development, we are planning uh, updates during the season. It is certainly going to be less um, than in, in previous years. Uh, simply because we know it's the last year of uh, the actual regulation. Uh, 2022 is, uh, is, uh, is a revolution for, for F1. We've got to redo a complete car, and it's also a great opportunity for a team like we or the midfield teams to, to do, if they do properly their homework, to, to be closer to the, to the front uh, from the onset of the, of the new reg. So it, it is no secret that we are certainly going to favor more the C42, so the 2022 car development during 21, than, uh, than developing until Abu Dhabi on the, this actual car because having a budget cap, having a, restrict, a limited resource, the more we put in the 21 car, the less we'll be able to put in the 22 car. And of course he works with um, Luca Fabato, who's been uh, chief designer at Salva for a few years now. Obviously, background at Toro Rosso, again, creating cars on a budget, very much what he does. Uh, he's been very good at it. I mean, I think, you know, sadly the performance over the past few years for Salva maybe doesn't reflect that. But again, these are all very good people, very good at their jobs. And then Alessandro Sinelli looking after the aero there. Um, obviously, our good friend Willem Toa is still a little involved 
with sound, but maybe not on the design um, of the, the current car, but certainly in terms of managing the wind tunnel and the facilities we've got there. And again, as you see the car there, you know, they're very much very independent thinking. They're not a, a Ferrari B team in design terms. They're not copying everyone uh, like so many other midfield teams are doing. They're really kind of, you know, plowing their own uh, farrow and, you know, the car looks individual for it. Whether the performance comes with that sort of independence, you know, I think that, you know, the season is there to uh, be the final arbiter of that. But um, you know, I think it's good that we do have teams like Alfa Romeo, Sauber, really doing their own thing in the sport and just making something that looks a little bit different from everybody else. Uh, since the end of the last year, obviously, um, there was Christmas was pretty soon afterwards. Uh, New Year, and then we came back to home in Switzerland and just, uh, you know, we spent time with family, the kids being in kindergarten, doing normal things. Obviously every year is slightly different, how you maybe prepare because, I don't know, conditions on the outside or the weather or about it, I try to enjoy it on the same time. If I don't feel that I, like I feel that um, I don't want to train, I don't train that day and I train next day. I mean, it's, it's not the uh, end of the day.